Okay, in this last lecture, we're going to be talking about specifically the economy. Uh, so as we talked about, uh, when we talked about social institutions, the economy is a social institution. It is a very important way of getting some of the basic needs of society met. Uh, and when we say uh, that, we're talking about a system of producing and distributing goods and services. So every society needs to have some way of making things and distributing the things that are made or the services that are performed uh, to the members of the society, and that's called the economy. So when we take a look at uh, how economies um, progress over time, uh, largely, again, in the modern world, we take a look at what we sometimes call uh, pre-industrial, industrial, and post-industrial economies. Uh, pre-industrial uh, economies started with hunter-gathering societies, uh, generally progressed through the, the uh, stage of pastoral horticultural societies, and largely were agricultural societies, where we saw, uh, again, in, in uh, pastoral, I'm sorry, in uh, hunter-gatherer societies, we saw very little differentiation among people uh, and subsistence living. And then as human beings learned to produce more and more and more, originally food, but then later on goods and uh, do more services, they created surplus. And that surplus uh, enabled those societies to get larger, but also uh, to uh, get more complex. We saw the advent of social inequality uh, that led all the way, as we said, through the growth of cities and nations. Uh, and then we talked about the Industrial Revolution, uh, where the majority of the world's societies, or at least, uh, I shouldn't say the majority, uh, a significant number of the world's societies uh, transformed from agricultural to industrial societies. Uh, what we definitely saw, uh, again, now trade between nations, and we saw some of the other ramifications, things like uh, colonialism, uh, other things like that. Um, but then we saw, uh, again, wider uh, social inequality, but generally a higher standard of living across uh, most of the globe. And then some societies even progressed beyond industrial to what we call post-industrial societies. Uh, we've talked about that when we talked about information and even uh, we're on the verge now of perhaps even becoming biotech societies. So we've seen this progression of economies. It's not been uniform around the world. Uh, we've seen different uh, societies uh, progress at different rates. Um, and then we talk about we talk about systems. Uh, there are different economic systems. Not all economies are the same. When we look around the world, we can clearly see the two uh, most distinguishable and uh, divergent uh, types of economic systems are capitalism and socialism. So we're going to discuss each of these kind of in turn and then talk about uh, uh, the modern world. So when we talk about capitalism, we're basically talking about an economic system that has three main features to it. Uh, within a capitalist economy, there's private ownership of, and again, remember this term we used, uh, we've used a couple times earlier, of the means of production. In other words, how things get made. Uh, again, term largely coming from Marx. Uh, when we talk about the means of production, we can think, especially in a large scale, we can think of things like factories. Um, but that doesn't necessarily have to be, it could be just anything. So it could be a shoe shop or a bakery. Um, but we're going to talk on a big global scale, so let's talk about things like uh, factories or power plants, okay, those kind of things. But in a capitalist society, private ownership is a characteristic, meaning individuals or groups of individuals can actually claim sole ownership over the means of production. So a person can own a business or a person can own a power plant or a factory or a shipyard or some uh, ways that contribute to, again, producing goods. The second characteristic is market competition. Okay, so we, um, when, when a, per, a product is made and then the determination is going to be how much will that product cost, the idea of market competition is that uh, all products are literally or uh, uh, figuratively taken to market and then it's the competition among various people who are presenting either the same or variations on the same product uh, and then the consumer has the ability to decide who they want to buy from, and typically what most people do is we know we'll shop around and try to get uh, that good or service for the least amount of money you possibly can. 
So the prices are going to be determined by that competition within the market. So in other words, if I produce, let's say I have a, a factory that produces uh, boots or shoes, and I produce a pair of boots and take it to a marketplace, like a farmer's market or something like that, I could walk in and say, oh, I'm really proud of these boots. I want $1,000 for them. And then someone else is likely to be producing a pair of boots of maybe comparable worth and said, I'm going to sell these for $10. Then clearly, am I going to sell mine at $1,000? Probably not, even though that's what I want. So I'm then going to have to adjust my price to meet the market standard. So I might drop my boots down to $12 and, or, or better yet, undercut the other person and say, I'll sell mine for uh, $9.99, hoping that someone now will buy my boots to save a penny from buying them from the competition. So it's that competition that's going to set the prices uh, in a, uh, a market uh, economy. And then, again, why are we doing this? Well, we're doing, I'm producing goods and uh, bringing them to market because, again, if it costs me $20 to make those boots, then I'm not going to want to sell them for $10. I'm going to want to pursue profit, meaning more than what it costs you to produce something. So if, let's say, the boots cost me $20 to make, I'm not going to want to sell them for $10. I'm going to want to sell them for $25. I'm going to want to make $5 off of what it cost me to produce those boots. So I can walk into the market and say, you know, I want $25 for these, and another person can say, I'm selling my boots for $20, I would have to make a decision whether or not I want to drop my price to $20 or not, knowing that that's what that cost me, because I will not then make a profit. So again, making something and selling it uh, for more than it costs you to produce. In a socialist economy, again, very different uh, definitions. So we talk about the public ownership of the means of production. So in a socialist economy, uh, the government or the state representing all the people who live in that uh, state or uh, economy or government or, or uh, nation own the means of production. So uh, you can say that the state owns it, but by definition, everybody in the society owns the means of production. So uh, a factory that produces boots that's owned by the state Technically, everybody who in the, in the state has an equal share in uh, that factory and what it produces. Central planning is the idea that it's the government and, uh, for the most part, committees or what the uh, groups of people who are considered specialists will then determine what the products that are produced in these state-owned uh, facilities make, what they will cost. So if, uh, let's go back to my boot. Uh, 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 factory. So the state owns the boot factory, the factory produces boots, and the central authority or central planning will say boots for everyone in society will cost $20. So if they know that it costs $20 to make the boots and they say uh, then that, again, because the third uh, characteristic is distribution of goods without concern or pursuit of profit. So the, the factory will make a thousand pairs of boots and central planning will say we are going to send 100 boots to this city and 100 boots to this city and 100 boots to that city and regardless of where those boots go or what else is going on in that area, they're all going to cost the same. One of the things we can see in that capitalism is prices can vary differently depending on people's locations or environments So what costs something in one place is not necessarily going to cost the same in another place based on the markets that exist in those areas. Whereas we see in socialism, the central planning will say it doesn't matter who or where in society you are, things are going to cost exactly the same. So, uh, and again, distributed without concern for making profit on them. So if boots cost $20 to make, chances are that's what the central planning will say boots should cost and distribute it equally among society. So we can clearly see these two systems have incredibly different ways of doing the exact same thing, producing and distributing goods and services. When we look at the rationale or the kind of the ideologies behind them, we can clearly see that in capitalism, uh, the idea of competition is valued. Uh, it's again, it's that idea of the pursuit of profit 
and this competition to manage prices is considered good, and that competition uh, uh, you know, drives people uh, for innovation, uh, to produ you know, produce more in different types of things, to produce things in greater diversity. So again, my boots might not be the kind of boots you want to buy, but somebody else will produce uh, a boot with another feature, or sneakers as opposed to boots. If you don't like boots, you can buy flip-flops. Okay? And these are the kind of things that a capitalist system is more likely, and again, one of the, uh, the, the benefits put out there by proponents, obviously, of capitalism will say that, uh, and there's also you know, more diversity and lower prices for the consumer, uh, clearly, when we talk about the ideology that drives socialism, it's that idea that profit in some ways is considered to be immoral. In other words, the pursuit of profit uh, just encourages people to exploit people. So, uh, if, you know, the, the, uh, the socialist idea is that if everybody is working uh, and knowing that they're going to get uh, the same product for the same price no matter where they are, there's not this desire or need then to uh, try to drive prices down by, let's say, exploiting workers or uh, having unsafe working conditions that the central planning will decide for the entire society uh, how much things should cost and where they're going to be distributed and that this uh, will lower people's incentive then to try to uh, exploit one another for this pursuit of profit. In other words, people are protected from exploitation. Um, criticisms, obviously, on each of these things, kind of the, the flip side of that coin, is that capitalism uh, promotes social inequality. So, uh, in other words, the haves and have-nots, as we've been discussing throughout the, the most of the entirety of this course, that uh, those people in power who own the means of production are then likely to continue to get richer, the rich get richer, and those people at the bottom of society who don't have very much are likely then to continue to be exploited. The poor get poorer, the haves and have-nots, as we've been talking about, uh, and that the haves, the people who own the means of production, will always be at an advantage and wield significant social, economic, and even political power to protect their own positions in society. So we see this widening of uh, social inequality in a capitalist system. And again, one of the major, or some of the major criticisms against socialism is that uh, it doesn't respect the rights or decision-making of individuals. Okay? So the people within society don't have a lot to say about what type of goods and services are being produced by the society. It's largely done by the government or by the state. So uh, and there's very little, uh, perhaps, input uh, into, uh, again, so market competition, the, the, argument given by capitalists that producers have to listen to consumers. So the consumers say, I want something, it'll be up to the capitalists to produce it, whereas one of the criticisms against socialism is that it's the central planning uh, that's going to determine what, quote unquote, the consumers want and how they should get it without very much uh, input from them. Um, also, sometimes, again, another criticism against socialism is that uh, it's largely considered to be uh, inefficient and that this idea of central planning is very slow to react to conditions uh, where again we sometimes say uh, one of the benefits posted up here is the market's very quick to react so um, you know there's a problem somebody will step in and solve that problem whereas in socialism again sometimes the, the, some of the characteristics of bureaucracies especially on the state level is that they're very slow to anticipate or react to changes in the economy. So uh, you could again use an oversimplified example to say, you know, um, uh, you know, central planning says that a factory is going to produce a thousand boots this year. Uh, the factory produces a thousand boots, but it turns out that there was a, you know, a huge increase in population and that's not enough boots. Or perhaps it's way too many and now there's a glut on the market, but they're still going out there and central planning is still sending them uh, to where they need to be and, and saying how much they should cost, and that's not reactive to the market. So clearly, we see very, very, very different ideologies and uh, perspectives coming from both of these economic systems. Now, we sometimes talk about uh, economic systems around the world as if 
uh, they exist in pure form. So sometimes we'll talk about the idea of America being a capitalist society or other societies, let's say China or the Soviet Union uh, when it existed, uh, were socialist societies and talk about them in these extreme uh, ways and say that they don't have any of the qualities of the other type in it, which is not true. Uh, we can certainly say America is and one of the most capitalist societies in the world. However, do we contain elements of socialism in our society? And the answer is, to a certain degree, yes. There are elements of socialism that exist in our society. We can certainly say that uh, when we talk about, again, uh, one of the goods and services that might be produced uh, in a capitalist society would be, let's say, fire protection. Okay? Uh, do we have a system in our society where fire departments are privately owned and people might have to pay for the privilege, as it were, or the service of having fires put out? No. We largely say that fire companies, other things like EMTs or uh, uh, police departments are publicly owned. They're owned by municipalities, okay? So you live in a town and you have a fire department, you are paying taxes. The taxes are the collective good, very much like public ownership. And that money is spent to uh, provide a service which is then available to the economy, or to the citizens, at no profit. So when, uh, unfortunately, if, again, to use a bad example, but if your house catches fire and the fire department shows up and put it out, they don't present you with a bill. Okay? Or they're not going to say, we won't save your house unless you can afford to pay us $6,000 or whatever the cost would be. That would be pursuit of profit. And what we're saying is in our society, no, there are some things we say shouldn't be profit driven that should be produced, again, a, a, a good or a service, which should be provided to the public largely at without profit. So even as a capitalist society, we do have elements of socialism. And many socialist societies have recognized some of the disadvantages uh, that are associated with socialism uh, and the criticism that we talked about. Uh, again, such as things like uh, you know, little diversity of products or services or low standards of living or, or uh, you know, difficulty getting uh, products produced and, and uh, and distributed efficiently have relied on and adopted some of the elements of capitalism. And when we talk about this, we, we sometimes talk about convergence theory, where we've seen that elements of capitalism and elements of socialism have sometimes combined uh, within uh, nations' uh, economies to produce, in a lot of cases, what's called democratic socialism. Uh, so sometimes we'll hear about this associated with some European countries uh, Sweden and Denmark are, are countries that, that come to mind, but there are other examples of democratic socialist uh, economies around the world, which again, convergence, uh, work to combine some of the elements of these. So we talk about, uh, largely when we talk about the, the socialist aspect, we'll talk about that first. It's usually public ownership of the, what are sometimes called uh, essential uh, uh, industries within a society. So things like communications and power and health, uh, education, are largely considered to be uh, run by the state and follow generally the uh, characteristics of a socialist government, whereas then we talk about capitalism existing on the level of, again, a lot of service industries uh, and uh, what we like to call small businesses, medium to small size businesses. So. Again, to use the example, a, a nation like Denmark or Sweden, <coughs> uh, the uh, transportation systems or uh, the uh, power plants or the television or communication systems might be owned by the state, but then uh, many other examples of capitalism would also exist. So things like restaurants and businesses, small businesses, uh, would exist on, in a capitalist society. So again, taking uh, uh, you know, the elements of both to, to blend them. Um, when we talk about how this plays out then kind of on the world, uh, we can definitely talk about, again, globalization. Uh, so the world clearly is becoming, 
for all intents and purposes, not physically smaller, but certainly more and more and more tied together as technology uh, continues to increase and bring the world closer and closer and closer together. <coughs> we call that globalization. There is a video uh, posted on the D2L shell. There's actually two videos I should mention. One is a, uh, again, short explanation of the differences between uh, capitalism and socialism, so you can watch that video to uh, kind of add to the knowledge of the discussion we put up here. Um, but also a video about globalization, which talks about uh, how the world, as I said, is, is uh, becoming more and more and more uh, tied to each other um, and uh, some of the effects of that. But one of the things we can definitely talk about, uh, and certainly a huge um, uh, issue that's going to continue to be talked about, is uh, while we can definitely say that there are socialist countries and democratic socialist countries uh, that many of the, the more, most industrialized nations in the world clearly fall much more along the lines of capitalism. And we could talk about, again, kind of corporate capitalism uh, as corporations get larger and larger and larger and spread around the world. We can definitely see these webs of uh, corporate capitalism uh, extending around the world uh, multinational corporations, again, large businesses which operate across international boundaries uh, that transcend uh, this idea of, of corporate, uh, of national, I'm sorry, of state interests. Um, and, and again, there's several implications for that. Uh, one is that uh, there's more and more and more of a push, especially as corporate capitalism spreads around the world, for there to be increased amounts of cooperation among nations. So one of the positives is sometimes looked at is this is uh, there's more and more of a demand for peaceful negotiations to allow uh, this market competition and the spread of markets around the world. Um, however, sometimes then again, we also talk about that capitalism, because of this pursuit of profit, sometimes then is perceived as um, uh, encouraging exploitation. Of, of the weaker countries around the world by the more strong nations. Um, so we sometimes point to this idea of as capitalism, especially corporate capitalism, spreads around the world, uh, you'll sometimes hear about uh, something called the New World Order. Uh, and that's this idea that around the world, uh, more and more and more nations uh, are, are uh, forming coalitions uh, against some, again, some of these uh, practices of multinational corporations. So we talk about things like uh, NAFTA, the European Union, uh, binding nations together and diminishing these national boundaries more in the interest of things like trade. And uh, uh, proponents of it say, of course, it's good because it is uh, increasing uh, cooperation among the nations of the world without these kind of uh, small national borders. Um, but of course, uh, we could talk about the danger of focusing, again, large amounts of power into a very small group of people at the very top of the global economy, uh, perhaps resulting in totalitarian either dictatorships or oligarchs.